chapter 11 and 12. We're going to go through two chapters today. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but as we move on, usually I don't go on to what dedication looks like. But dedication now starts with us, as I already mentioned. Dedication starts here. The person that usually often needs to change is first me. And, and it's that person. I don't know about you, 
But when I look in the mirror, that person in the mirror is the one that gives me the most trouble. He's cranky. He's hangry. There's a lot of different things that go on in that person's life that make me like that. But as we look upon our slide this morning, a wasted life. Many of us have seen wasted lives. Some of us, even my life was wasted in the beginning till God got a hold of me. I was wasting my life and I didn't know where I was going. It was until I dedicated my life unto Him. And you know, I don't think we make it a set of going out and being wasteful, right? We don't make a conscious decision of saying, I'm going to waste things. We don't do that. But I don't know if you grew up with moms like this. They would say, eat everything on your plate because people are starving in China. (laughs) I could never understand that. I'm like, how am I going to eat all of this stuff that's going to help the people in China? And what she should have told me is that you're being wasteful. If she would have told me you're being wasteful, I would have probably gotten it. But I could never understand the concept of what she was trying to tell me. But we live in a time and day and hour right now that we live in a wasteful nation. We live in a wasteful state. But one thing I see in today's culture, today's day and hour is people wasting their lives. Wasting their lives on things that don't matter. Like, example, if you were to look at statistics of how much time people spend on their phones... How much time people spend on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, work, material possessions, status, and influence, it would blow your mind. The statistics of seeing you stop at a stoplight is like a year and so many months that throughout your lifetime you spend over a year at stoplights. It's kind of crazy, but if you look at what's changing now on on all of these social media things, people are wasting their lives away on different things. And you know, people are raising their children with this. Just put it in front of them and that's what's raising them. How is that training up a child in the ways of the Lord? How is that showing them right from wrong? And it's hard for us to understand what we've got going on in our nation is because that's beginning to happen. There's no sitting and talking with our children, putting away our phone at dinner and talking. That's a lost art. We've, we've, uh, when my kids were small, we started to get, begin to see that. When we'd sit at a, a baseball game or something, everybody's quiet and everybody's on their phone. Nobody talks anymore. It's just a crazy thing to me. But it amazes me to see so many people are, have say that they are dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ, yet there's no evidence in their lives that they are. There's a a man once said, if being a Christian was against the law and they caught you for it, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It shows in the way we live life day after day. Our responses, our actions speak louder than our words can ever. Many are sold into the idea that I'm okay. I'm okay. My relationship with God is good. But I ask you, by what gauge are you using that? How are you understanding that you're okay? i just like to understand that. How did you come to that understanding? In Matthew 12, 30, it tells us this. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. Anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So that's basically telling you either you're for him or against him. There's no middle ground. If you look at scripture for what it is, it's black and white. It's either you're there or you're not. And it's going to show in the way you live. You know, we each have to make a choice here. You know, those people at that day as Jesus was sharing with them, they had to say if they were for him or against him. Am I going to walk with you or am I going to walk away with you? Because when we make the decision to walk with Him, then starts a life of change. Then we start to look at an instruction manual for our life and say, what does this require, this life require of me? There's many that say, oh, you just need to say that simple prayer and that's it. There's more to God's Word than that. I don't want you to go out of here void without truth because of that. Because there's an understanding and a way you and I are supposed to be living. You know, many people can think that it's by their good works. 
I pushed the old lady's basket. I opened so many doors and I gave $5 to this and I did this. It's about works and it's not about that. It's about Jesus Christ accepting him here and living for him. He says to extend his kingdom, to make his kingdom bigger. What does that mean for us? There's a command to go out and make disciples of all nations. That's us going out, helping people, doing other things. There's so many different things that that entails, but it's in scripture here. Many people think that they can go to heaven just by being good. That's another lie. The people that explain that, they haven't read their Bible. You know, Jesus asked his own disciples, and we, we passed over this recently. He says, who do people say that I am? Oh, he's a good person, or he's a John the Baptist, all these. But we have the same question to us this morning. Who is Jesus to you? Think about that deeply. Who is Jesus to you? Is he just someone that was on the cross or not on the cross, or it's just something that you wear on your neck? What is Jesus, and who is he to you personally? That's a question I ask you this morning. Either we acknowledge he, who he said he is, or he's not. And I believe this is shown by our dedication and living for him. If he's Lord of our lives, there's going to be evidence in a changed life. You know, I can tell people, people that come to me, and I've been, I've been like this before in my, in my life. I used to go to church, but I checked the box. It never changed me. I never took hold of what God was saying to me. I just came to church, and I did my work, God, in expecting something. We expect just by that we're going to be, you know, glorious. But he said, oh, be obedient to me. Follow me. In Luke's gospel, the sixth chapter, verse 46, he tells us this. So why do you keep, me, keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? We call him Lord, but he's expecting some, a certain way of living out of us. So that's just, what is that called? Disobedience, right? And we don't serve a hateful God. People say, oh, he's an angry God. No, he just expects obedience. He just wants us to follow what he's called us to follow. As we begin to look into our study this morning, that was just the beginning. So uh, hopefully we can begin to understand why we must dedicate our own lives. As we dedicated these children this morning, why is it and why are we going to dedicate our own lives to him? And the importance of why we must do that. So as we, uh, if you guys got your Bibles, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read um, Romans 12 first instead of the uh, verse, chapter 11. So I'm going to read chapter 12 of Romans 1 and 2 first. So follow along with me if you would. And I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation this morning. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So we get to see there that he wants to bless us in that. He says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. So we won't know that till we look at chapter 11 of what he's done for us. Many of us already know what he's done for us. And he sealed us for the day of Jesus Christ. Christ is coming back. He said he would, and I hang on his promise. Are you ready for that? Whether he comes back or you pass from this life to the next, are you ready today? That's the question I ask you. But looking at this here, if we look back at chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, I ask you to turn with me there. It says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways? For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? Look at verse 36. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. 
He says everything comes from him and exists by his power and intended for his glory. Once we get past that, it's better for us. Because when we, a lot of times, and I still think this at times, that I'm here for my own self, my own, for my own glory, or what I'm going to make of this American dream. But if I look at scripture, everything comes from him and is intended for him. To bring him glory. My life, your life can bring him glory by the way you live. It says a gentle answer turns away wrath. Have you ever practiced that? Because when somebody spews something at me, what's our reaction? Shoot from the hip, let's shoot back. You know what I mean? What if we started practicing some of the things that were in Scripture? We'd have a different place that we live in. But I think that Scripture has been closed off from the minds of people now, and it's starting to diminish. And you're seeing it in society. We're seeing people shoot each other every, almost every single night. We're getting to see hate for one another because people have forgotten what God has called us to do and how to live. So if we were to say God is our Lord, we all call him Lord and our master. Do we understand that we're servants after that? If we were to boil that word down in the Greek, it's a slave. I don't think many of us like to hear the word slave, but that's what God calls us. We're slaves of his righteousness, of who he is. When we're slaves, we give up ourselves, our rights to do his. Those of you that are employed, do you tell your boss, hey, I'm not just going to do it today. You just handle it on your own. (laughs) They buy your time. You have an agreement that they buy your time. And Jesus Christ, when you've accepted him, you're saying, here, I'm, I'm yours. Do with me what you want. It's hard to do that. It's hard to come to that realization to letting yourself go. Here in that passage in Romans 11, Paul in his heart was filled with worship and praise and admiration because of who he used to be and he got to see what God had done in him and now he's changed. Paul was excited when he wrote this. He understood that everything comes from God. It all exists for him and it's all for his glory. Nothing that he has done can be credited to him, only to God. Even the psalmist in Psalm 40, verse 5, says, O Lord my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans are for us, for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to an end of them. You know, if we understand that God has given us everything, that breath that you have right now is His. It's hard to understand with our thinking that way. Everything that we have, we say, well, I work for it, but He's given you the ability to do it. But I've got to ask myself, even here this morning, why do I do what I do? Is it for the glory of Christ or for it, is it for my glory? Sadly enough, it's a lot of times I want to be a people pleaser. I want to say, oh, good job. I want to hear that rather than serving my Lord. And it's, it's all God's work. If not, I would probably be in, in prison right now. I'd be doing hopefully prison ministry if he was gracious because of what I was into before God got a hold of me. So I stand here knowing what that looks like. Understanding this, that we can't do nothing apart from him. Even breathe. C.S. Lewis once wrote, to argue with God is to argue with the very power that makes it possible to argue at all. You know, I, I hear Sammy up here when he's playing. He's playing the guitar and, he, and he's told me, Dad, I understand that I've been given grace and mercy to be up here to play. He says, could God can strip me of that right quick? He can cut off my hand. I can get an accident. I can, there's so many different things that he can take away. And he's just thankful that he's able to do what he's doing. As am I here this morning. Colossians 1, verses 16 through 18 tells us, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. 
and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning, supreme ru- ruler over who rise from the dead, so he is the first in everything. So everything was created through him and for him, even us. You want to see change in your life? You want to see big change? Surrender your life over to him. Say, here I am, Lord. See what he's got for you. Once you start to pick up his word and start to read through it, you begin to see it open up for you. You'll never understand who God is till you open your Bible and start to read. You can sit here and come for one hour a week and get a piece of it, but you'll never understand the fullness of who God is till you search for him yourself. So in verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Paul writing to the, to the Romans here, he says, I'm, I appeal to you, I beseech you, I exhort you, plead with you, beg of you. Paul is pleading with these people to dedicate their lives over to the Lord. Paul's words are still ringing today, begging us this morning that we would give ourselves unto the Lord, that we would dedicate our lives over to him. I also plead with you this morning. I see the importance of it. I get to see people in their best and in their worst. I I do a lot of funerals. I do a lot of weddings. I see happy and sad people. And I get to see what that looks like. I get to see the believer. Yes, they're sad, but they have hope that they'll see that person again. We can see his, Paul is passionate about it, what he's talking about here. Because it's a life of, it's a, a matter of life and death. Do you believe that? What you believe is a matter of life and death. That's why I plead with you this morning as a dedication as unto the Lord. And what does that look like? George Whitfield, an evangelist, once said to his congregation, he says, you blame me for weeping, but how can I help it when you do not weep for yourselves, though your immortal souls are on the verge of destruction? Have we ever heard the term playing with fire? Sometimes we play with fire and don't know what's at the end of it. I believe in our hearts we know when we're not living according to what God has called us to live. I believe that to be true. We know when we're doing wrong. And sometimes we don't use any means to correct it. We want to hear what the world has to say rather than what God's word has to say. Let's see what my brother says, what my cousin says. Let's see what my mom says rather than coming to what the truth is, which will never lead you astray. What does giving up our body as a sacrifice look like? It's we, we passed over to dying to oneself, picking up our cross and following him. What it means is putting all of our things aside and putting God first. It's, it's first surrendering our lives over to him. Surrender is a battle term from the army. It implies giving up all our rights to, con- to the conqueror. Any of you in the military have been in the military? When you go to the military, they own you. You're theirs. You don't do what you want to do. You do what they say. And this is what he says. When you surrender to me, I'm asking you to do what I'm asking you to do. And I'll make your ways straight. I've lived a life where I went down my own ways and say, oh, I think this is going to be right. And I made a mess of it. Instead of following it, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. God has a plan for you and for me. Surrendering him, surrendering to him means putting our stuff aside and putting him first. Do you think God has a plan for you? Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. We all like to hang our hat on that, right? 
but unlike our own plans, they often lead to destruction and heartbreak. A lot of my decisions have led to heartbreak. But he conquers us to bless us. Many people think of the, the Lord's blessings as we hear the prosperity gospel going on today. Oh, be, live your best life now. That's a, a mess. God is going to bless us with his presence himself. He'll continue to provide. He says, first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he'll add everything that you need. There was once a girl in a church service and they were passing the plates around. And when it arrived to her, she got it and she put it on the floor and she stood on it. And then when the ushers came around, they said, what are you doing? He says, well, she says, I learned in Sunday school that I'm supposed to give myself to the Lord. She nailed it. It's more important to give yourself son, to the Lord than to give your money. To give yourselves. People think that it's going to suffice the Lord if I give you a couple bucks in the box. He wants you. He wants a personal relationship with you. If we call him our God, how often do you communicate with that God? Do you communicate with him as you do your friends, your spouse? Really think about that. How often do you connect with him? <laughs> God wants all of us, not just on Sundays. Think about that. I've shared with you before. 52 hours. That would be 52 weeks. 52 hours that we would be giving ourselves to the Lord. Give only 52 hours to your spouse and what would happen? Someone that you say you love. As we look at verse here, at verse 2 here, in a sense we have a formula how to avoid the wasted life that I'm talking about. Don't waste it on this world. Because as we've seen it, I don't know if you've paid attention, crumbling. But verse 2 tells us this. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's perfect will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We get to see that formula. Don't copy the behavior and the custom of this world. Why do you fall into every, Let's do what everybody else is doing. The norm. But look at where it's going. It's falling apart. J.B. Phillips in his commentary wrote this. He says, Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good meets all his demands and moves towards the goal of true maturity. How often is it to be, how easy is it for us to be influenced by the world? Right? If you hang out with people with a fifth wheel with a big diesel truck for long enough, you're going to have one of them too. Big house, big land, farm animals, you're going to have that. If you're into whatever, that's what you start to become. It's not a bad thing, but when you put those things first, that's the bad thing. God is not telling us we can't have anything and we're supposed to live in a hut. No, he's not saying that. But if, is, is those things first? How much, do you t how much time do you spend on those things rather than on him? I used to be a hunter. I loved to hunt, loved to fish. I don't get to do it very often anymore because my true devotion is here. He's called me here. Strip away everything else. I want to put you first. He still gives me blessings of going. It just changed. When we live for him and dedicate our lives to him, we won't have any regrets. I guarantee it. I don't miss the old lifestyle. I don't miss the old lifestyle of waking up not knowing where I was at. Some of you guys know where I am at. Some of those places of like, what did I do last night? God has changed my life into that. I'm glad that he had mercy on me. How many of us can say, I'm a good person. My life is good. 
Why dedicate my life to the Lord and waste my time? There may be some of you like that this morning. May I ask though, are you really okay? Be honest with yourself. Are you honestly okay? Because I bet you when you're alone, you're not okay. When you're around, when you're around people, you're okay. But when you're alone, are you okay? God steals our heart in the midst of that. When things are going off, I heard a story of, of, uh, of an artist. And they were portraying what uh, peace looks like. Peace and tranquility. And two, two painters, they painted these pictures. And one painted this picture of a lake with no ripples on it. And he's sitting there in a boat in the moonlight. It was not, that's what he... But the one who won it drew a big, huge waterfall that was crashing and these waves all over. But in the back of that waterfall was a mother, little bird, and her chicks. And she sat there minding her own business. That was stillness. In the midst of that mess, she was still. And that's how you and I can be still. In the midst of what's going on in this world, you and I can be still, knowing that he's in control. Regardless of what happens, You know, have we ever asked ourselves when we pass from this life to the other, then what? You ever thought about that far out? What happens to you when you die? Is there a kiosk in heaven? Do you have to talk to Peter? Do you have to fill out a form? We all think some crazy things, you know what I mean? But what happens the instant that you die? There's only two possible places, and he's talked about. And according to the Bible here, not everyone who dies goes to heaven. Only those who do the will of the Father. Matthew seven twenty one. Also in Romans three ten it says, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. We don't have it together. Only he does. I can sit here and preach to you, but I don't even have it together. I'm trying. I'm working on my life. God is working with me and through me and to help others as well. I don't claim to have it together. I'm working. I still have my struggles that you have struggles with. But I'm a lot different than I used to be because of God. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who have dedicated their lives over to Christ. Even in the hard times, they won't affect you. Does this mean we're perfect? No. We're going to blow it. You guys blown it before? I've blown it several times. But God picks me up, dusts me up, say, okay, keep on going. Don't fall back into your old ways. And it's weird how we go back to that. The scriptures even talk to us about going back to our vomit. How many of us would ever go back to vomit? But essentially, that's what we do when we start going back into that old lifestyle that we once got away from. We fall back in there. We go back, start to lick it up. That's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Romans 4, 7 also tells us, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Those of you who have ever had a rap sheet, can you imagine that just cleared away? There was nothing ever. That's what God does when you give yourself over to him. There's no condemnation for you anymore. There's nothing to hold against you. When a police officer pulls you over and he runs your, your information, he would be clean. That'd be awesome. 2 Corinthians 3.2 tells us, the only letter of recommendation we need is, is you yourselves. Your lives are a letter written in, in your hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work uh, among you. So what Paul is saying here is if we're letters written, we're letters read by all men. If we were a letter read by all men, what would the letter say about you? If there was a letter put out 
of who you were, what would it say about you? Would it really say that you're dedicated to the Lord? That you follow God? What would it explain, honestly? I had to think of it myself. What would that letter would say about me? Lord, I'm just faking it till I make it. You know, there's many different things we can think of. As we're coming towards the end here, those of you that have kids, older kids, like, like my own children, I have, they have keys to my house. They have keys that open everything. But what if I only gave them the key that opened just the wrought iron door in the front? It would shut them out, out of everything else. And that's what we do with God sometimes. We only give Him one key to one area of our life, and yet all oh, there's a whole other set of rooms that are locked because I'm not ready to give them to you, Lord, because I'm ready and continue to live in that place. You need to give him all the keys to all the rooms that you can open them up and let him clean out some of the trash like I had that he could begin to work on you. I used to tell the Lord, Lord, that door's off limits. I still want to deal with that. I could never get rid of that thing and it grew up into a monster in that closet. So this morning, before we go into communion, I ask this question. Have you given the Lord all the keys to your house, to this house, that he can open it up and search you? Are you dedicated to him? Do you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Ask yourself that question. When I looked last time, Christ gave all for us. He didn't say, Leonard, you're not worth it. Look at what you've done. He said, I would do it over and over and over. And that's what he's telling you. There's some of us here maybe this morning that have been living a wasted life. That there's no meaning. You ask yourself day and night, what am I even doing here? Maybe even the thoughts of suicide. Because you don't know where you're headed. God has a plan for you. If you'd only submit to him, surrender to him, say, here I am, direct my steps. Life can change. Things can change right now, this day. This day we can turn around and say, Lord, I want to dedicate my life to you. As we got to see these children are dedicated, are we dedicated? That's the biggest thing. Your face.
Turn bones into armies. You turn seas into. 